We are in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, and Isaiah is the first of the major prophets found in God's Word, and as we have reflected each week as we picked up our study in the book of Isaiah, just by way of reminder, we are remembering that all of the prophets fold back into First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and they fit there. And so we have Isaiah, the first of the prophets, 66 chapters. We have 66 books in the Bible. 39 chapters in the book of Isaiah deal with God's judgment. Um, the first 39 books in the Bible are the Old Testament. The remaining 27 chapters in the book of Isaiah deal with God's redemption. And the remaining 27 books in the Bible, the New Testament. So we have some interesting parallels leading us, leading some people to call and I think you're free to call this book this. It's the Bible in miniature. And it, again, it's one of these books that prophesies with such exactitude that some of the modern liberal theologians don't believe that it could possibly have been written by one man, especially with the, the way the Bible, um, the way the book turns uh, after the first 39 chapters. So some interesting things to think about, but uh, uh, that is not an interesting thing to think about. This, is, this book is written by the Holy Spirit, and uh, Isaiah was just an instrument in the hands of the Holy Spirit, as always. And uh, it is my firm belief that this is the Word of God uh, pronounced through a single man, a single author. And that's why we have the book of Isaiah. So let's go to the Lord in prayer for our time in Bible study here tonight. Father, we thank you for the, the glory of this Word and the glory of the pronouncements that you make in this particular passage that we have to cover here tonight. And we are thankful, Lord, for the way that it not only looks behind, it looks ahead, and it puts a foundation under our feet that no matter what happens, no matter what kind of earthquakes or storms come, we see our continuing existence, and we see the, the reign of Christ uh, who will come again uh, for his church and for his people. And we long for that day, Lord. We, we long to be in that day, so to speak. And so we pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts for that day tonight in this time of Bible study, and lead us by your Holy Spirit, we pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I sort of covered the first six verses of Isaiah chapter 9 um, last week, getting up to the prophecy about the child um, being born, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Uh, verse 6, very profound verse in God's Word. And we said, and just by way of reminder, you know, this is after, in chapter 8, God pronouncing certain judgment on the southern kingdom of Judah. Why? Because under Ahaz, they had strayed. And there had been sort of a downward spiral anyway, but under Ahaz, that had really gained speed, gained impetus, and the whole nation was now descending into the mire. And it seemed as though nothing could stop that progress and nothing could stop that process. So after pronouncing certain judgment upon Judah, as we saw, uh, from Assyria, no less, the kingdom that they were allying themselves with in defense of themselves against the attack of Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel, the amazing thing is that in the midst of this kind of judgment coming upon the land that is, that is certain and devastating, God promises their continuing existence, and he does that by informing them of the Messiah who is yet to come. And very profoundly, just backing up to verse 1 in chapter 9, nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. Uh, the distress uh, was related to them in chapter 8. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon them upon her who is distressed as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, the northern part of the northern kingdom, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. Um, what we're seeing here is that the, the prophecy entails uh, verses 1 and 2 um, as we will note, moving into verse 2, in Galilee of the Gentiles, last line of the first verse, moving into verse 2, and thinking about the relationship between the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, and this would be very strange to these people who regarded the, the northern kingdom as enemies since the time of Rehoboam. 
the prophecy is that the Messiah will come in Galilee of the Gentiles. There in verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. And the prophecy is that the center of Jesus' ministry, and those of, if, those of you who've been to Israel as we have, those who were along with us when we were in Israel, remember that the, the great scope of Jesus' ministry took place along the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, beginning at, at Nazareth and Capernaum and, and villages along the the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and it was only when he came up to the feast that he would venture down to Jerusalem. So the center of his ministry would be Galilee, strangely enough, not Jerusalem. Not Jerusalem, as prophesied here, and that literally was um, fulfilled, was it not? And then in verses 3 through 5, we have a rendering of the second coming of Christ, and that's the way that this book lays out. It gives you the near prophecy um, near in the sense that we're talking 740 years thereabouts, but that's a lot closer than 740 plus 2,000 some odd years until the second coming of Christ. And, and so it's all folded together, background, foreground. We see it all flat in flat relief, and we can't necessarily pick out the distance, only we know because we've seen the first part of this prophecy fulfilled in Jesus who is the Christ. In this, of the second coming, Isaiah writes, as the instrument of God, you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel for fire. So when Jesus comes, that will be the end of warfare. And what he's speaking of there is that, hey, all those garments that were used, all those military uniforms, even the bloodstained uniforms, they're going to be rolled up and they're going to be burned. They're not going to be necessary anymore. They're never going to be needed again. Why? Because unto us a child is born. And unto us a son is given, speaking of his humanity, Unto us a child is born. We recognize the frame of a child. We recognize the form of a baby. And unto us a son is given. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He is a great gift, the greatest gift that's ever been given to mankind, the greatest gift that's ever been given to the universe, really because, as Paul says in Romans, all of creation groans waiting for the redemption which will take place when Jesus comes to set all of captivity free. Amen. And his name shall be called, again, not Wonderful Counselor, but his name shall be called Wonderful. And his name shall be called Counselor. And his name shall be called, get this, Mighty God. The Son of God will be called Mighty God. The Messiah will be called Mighty God. Uh, Jesus, when he walked in his ministry life, what the Pharisees and the Sadducees had against him was that he claimed to be God. Make no mistake about it, they understood that, and that's why they picked up stones to throw at him. And, and Jesus said, for which of these works do you stone me? Because he was doing good works. He was giving eyesight to the blind. He was healing the lame. He was raising the dead. He was teaching with authority. For which of these works do you stone me, he said to the Pharisees. Oh, we don't stone you for the works. We stone you for claiming to be God. That's why we pick up stones to throw at you. Make no mistake, they, they knew that Jesus was claiming to be God, and, and that is what upset the, him, them, and that was ultimately what caused them to put him to death. He is mighty God, Messiah. Jesus is God, everlasting Father and Prince of Peace, and then when we move into to verse 7, we see the, the dynamism, the, the impact of his all-time um, governance, which was born on that cross, which was earned by that cross, that title deed to the earth passed to Jesus. And in Revelation chapter 5, the seals beginning to come off. He is, the title deed has now been transferred to Jesus. He owns it all. And it was through that cross that he purchased us and he purchased the world through his blood. 
And so of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. It's an eternal government. It's not a government that changes every four years. It's not a government that has a lifetime um, servitude like on the Supreme Court. No, this is a, a governing that will last forever and ever and ever and ever, and it will never change, and it will be Almighty God ruling on the earth, and we can go ahead and get used to that by allowing Almighty God to already govern our lives. And the choice is ours whether we allow our God to rule in our hearts, and by allowing God to rule in our hearts, we're actually preparing ourselves for his governance for all eternity. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Think about that, the, the increase of his government. And, and we think about our own government and how frail it is and how futile it is in meeting the needs of the people. In Texas, for example, they put in all those windmills, very environmentally friendly, very foolish as it turns out because windmills freeze. And they have to use fossil fuels to sort of clear them up. You know, they gotta, they got to use helicopters using helicopters fly on fossil fuels. And they fly over those uh, windmills and they dump fossil fuels on the, on the blades of the windmills and the motors of the windmills to, to try to get them to turn again. 40% of Texas's power is generated by windmills. I, I was really shocked to see that because, you know, Texas is generally thought of as, a, as an oil state. But uh, this is the impact that foolishness has upon our nation in these days. And, and we pay the price for a government that rules by nonsense, basically. They, they certainly do not rule by logic. But the main thing is they don't rule by the Holy Spirit. They don't rule as led by the Holy Spirit. And so the promise of God's government is that it will be perfect, that it will meet every need, that it will be empowered by love. Imagine that, a government empowered by love rather than force. And there will be no end to that. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, perfect judgment, perfect justice without prejudice from that time forward even forever. And listen to this, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It's like God is in heaven Christ is in heaven, the Holy Spirit arranging things, and it's, I cannot wait. I cannot wait to do this. I am, as I look down on the earth, I am waiting for that last one to be saved who I know will be saved, and then I'm off. I, I can't wait. I'm very zealous to rescue my kids out of this tragic world and judge this world and, and shake this world and purify this world and, and then come back to rule and reign for a thousand years, for a thousand years. Huh. That's pretty amazing prophetic content. 740 years prior to these events even beginning to unfold in the birth of the Christ child. And, you know, you have to imagine that, at least I do, the scroll that Isaiah is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I mean, 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed. All, all Scripture is, comes under the inspiration of God. It's all God-spoken, if you will. It's God's Word. But can you imagine writing this 740 years before Christ what you just wrote after getting through with verse 7 and just kind of looking at it and reading it over the way that, that authors often do. Um, you know, you write a bit and then you kind of reread it and it's like, what is this? What, what, did, I, what did I just write under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? And, and I love Peter's explanation of this in 1 Peter chapter 1 where he said in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 10, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. And that's exactly what Isaiah is doing in this case, 740 years before Christ was born, and searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them so the Spirit of Christ is in them, causing them to write these words, which they have no idea about. It's not like they're looking back, like we have the vantage point of, of looking back, seeing the events having unfolded at least 
up and through the birth of Christ and his ascension into heaven, which literally happened in exactly the way that it was described in the Bible over 300 times, and looking forward to, because of that exactitude, knowing that prior fulfilled prophecy proves that prophecy that yet remains shall be fulfilled exactly as it is written. We have that confidence. And yet these men writing so far before the events transpired, this, this idea of, of foreground prophecy rendering mixed with background prophecy men, uh, meandering, you know, 2,000, at least 2,000 some odd years apart from the birth of Christ to the return of Christ, because that's yet future, and writing it all flat and seeing it all on one page. Very confusing. Searching what or what manner of time the Christ, the Spirit of Christ who was in them, was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. See, we have this advantage. We have this very great blessing. To us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which the angels desire to look into, and the angels are amazed by the grace of God. Because for the angels, those that fell have no opportunity for grace. And those that remain are amazed by grace because they see the fallen nature of, of those that are created. Angels are not created in the image of God. We are. And we receive the blessing of grace as those who are created in his image. Amazing stuff, if you think about it. You know, this certainly was on the apostles' minds on the day that Jesus ascended into heaven. In Acts chapter 1, we see... Their mind's kind of blown by what's taking place. Jesus has been raised from the dead, and he's just told them to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which you shall receive not many days from now. Don't go out and do ministry, guys, even though you know how to do ministry, even though you know what to do when it comes to ministry, because you've been watching me do ministry for three and a half years. Wait, wait, wait for the power that is required for ministry, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus taught them that, they said in verse 6, Lord, listen to what they're asking. Given what we just read in Isaiah chapter 9, in verses 6 and 7, now they've seen the Messiah. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? That's a logical question based on biblical prophecy and thinking that it's all taking place in the same time frame when it is not. And that's one of the most important things to understand about biblical prophecy is this foreground background business that, that takes place even in adjacent verses that we understand more fully. And Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. So that's gonna happen when the Father says that it shall happen. You don't need to worry about it. You guys just need to get busy, you know? For you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and even to the whole world. And then he was ascended into the kingdom of heaven. And that's the part where we just recently talked about on, on Sunday, you know, the the angels were there looking at the, the apostles and the disciples who were just looking up into the sky and they were kind of dazed and confused and, and the angels basically said, hey, get busy, guys. You know, you just got your marching orders. It's no time to be looking up into the sky. Let's, let's get busy. Let's, let's get after the great, the great Commission. So right after this, right after the promises that are given of their, you know, when, whenever your nation is in the, the, the throes of destruction by mighty forces that you are not capable of, of defending yourself against. How wonderful it is that God gives a prophecy that secures, that speaks of your eternal existence or your, your long-term existence way out there in the future. And so if your existence is going to be way out there in the future, that means that you're going to survive this. And the same thing is true for us. No matter what's going on right now in this crazy world that we find ourselves in, these prophecies of our future secure our existence, and let us know that we will be there. We win. 
We have the victory, even though we, it looks like we're, we're under the dominance of overwhelming forces. And so in the remainder of chapter 9, immediately is another prophecy, a return to the dangerous immediate future they face. Why? Um, remember, Isaiah is prophesying to the southern kingdom of Judah. So the southern kingdom under Ahaz has turned in a very wicked direction. And so we have this, these words that speak of a dangerous immediate future. Why? For their unfaithfulness to God poured out upon the northern kingdom first. And, and so what happens to the northern kingdom as they are devastated by Assyria will be a real-time picture for you about what's coming your way unless you repent. And that works for us as well as for them. You know? We see what happened in the northern kingdom under Assyria, and Assyria destroyed them and carried them away captive, and it was God's judgment upon that land because they had turned completely to idol worship, and they had installed their own priests, and they had sort of just created their own religion um, in the northern kingdom, which would get even worse um, as they were exiled away by Assyria. And the Assyrians were an incredibly cruel people. Um, it's known historically the, the cruelty that was practiced upon the people that were captured by the Assyrians. Sometimes entire towns would commit suicide rather than surrender to the Assyrians because the Assyrians would do things like skin people alive, they would put hooks in their jaws. They would rape the women. They cut open the bellies of the pregnant women. They did horrendous, horrific things, tragic things. And so what's taking place there, um, the wickedness of the Assyrians, that should be a wake-up call. And so we see beginning in verse 8 of chapter 9, the Lord sent a word against Jacob, which is another name for the northern kingdom, and, and it's fallen on Israel. And it's interesting, you know, Jacob basically means heel catcher. That's, that's the name that God calls, God himself calls the northern kingdom. They're just, you know, they're not, they're not Israel. Um, I, I, I call them Jacob first. And they call themselves Israel. All the people will know Ephraim and the inhabit of Samaria who say in pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. You know, when a hurricane comes through, sometimes a city, a coastal city benefits because what happens is the hurricane comes through on some of these coastal cities that got there first and they built up, you know, condos and stuff like that in the 1950s and it's sort of a, you know, it's just not a very nice community in terms of some of the upscale things that we see. So a hurricane comes through and blows all those buildings down or, or destroys them or partially does them. And then the real estate developers come in and they build new and they build dig, big. And all of a sudden that community attracts a, a whole different real estate market. And, and this is the, the kind of pride that they're talking about. Hey, if, if our buildings get knocked down, we're just going to build bigger and we're going to build better. And they say that in pride. And God relates it that way. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. So they got brick houses, which are functional, but boy, nice stone houses. That's what we're going to rebuild with. We actually have our eye on, on upgrading and updating the, the architectural style. Um, the sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. So you see, we're going to replace those Eh, not so majestic trees with mighty, mighty trees. We're going to replant when the trees are torn down. Saying all these things in pride. When God is chastening, we don't have enough resources to outlast his chastening. Do we? Have you ever found yourself in that place trying to outlast God's chastening? as you continue to walk in sin in your life. And that's what God is, is declaring here. We do not, this nation does not. You know, the, and, and again, this crisis from the, the winter storm is a, a very sort of real indicator. The thin veneer of protection of grocery stores, of hospitals, of police, 
of military forces. We feel protected by the police because so few people are involved in crime. What if everybody was involved in crime at one time? There's not enough policemen to stop it. We feel protected. We feel like we have food in the grocery stores until there's a run on it, until everybody wants the same thing at the same time. How long did it take you to get toilet paper back in the spring? <laughs> Months. Months. It's just now kind of back in stock. There was another little run on it. Um, it that blew my mind. Is like, what does toilet paper have to do with COVID? I don't, I don't quite get that, but... Anyway, it happened. Uh, we see it around here a lot whenever there's a hurricane trying to get gasoline. Um, the, what protects us is that thin veneer of the fact that nobody's, you know, we're not all filling up our cars at the same time. And, and the same thing is true for the military and, and hospitals. What if everybody gets sick at the same time? There's, there's no way. Hospitals are built predicting the percentage of the population that will be populating those hospitals at any given time. And so they try to stay a little bit ahead of that. And we saw, again, we saw some of the fear that came through the, the pipeline when the COVID thing was, was announced and everybody was terrified of the fact that the emergency rooms wouldn't be able to handle the COVID and that's why we had to stay inside for two weeks. It turned into a year. It turned into a year and a half and now they're saying it's two years. I'm not sure what that is, but we're trying to protect ourselves with that little, you know, that little thin veneer so when God is chastening you, for you to try to outlast God, if God truly is chastening you in your personal life about something in your personal life, <laughs> the sooner you repent, the better. Because his chastening is an indication that he loves you. And so to repent and relent, the sooner, the better. So, you know, as they try to outlast the Lord, Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of Rezin against him, king of Syria, and spur his enemies on, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth, whole mouth, one swallow. And then we have these very graceful verses intermingled here, um, verse 17, verse 21, the fourth verse of the next chapter. Same exact thing is stated. For all this, his anger is not turned away. For all what? For all of their bad behavior, for all of their wickedness, for all of their sin, for all of their turning away from God, for all of their claims that there is no God, that we would rather worship this block of wood or this, or this pillar of stone or whatever it may be, this gold object, that we would rather do that as they did in the northern kingdom, golden bulls in a priesthood that had no relationship to the design of the priesthood that God had set in order before the Israelites when they came into the promised land. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Will you repent? Please, please, will you repent? Because in the moment you repent, God relents. Isn't that amazing? Repentance, I think, is one of the sweetest words in God's word because we know that in the instant that it happens, it's done. The work is done. This is what God is, is trying to get you to come to in your life. For all this, his anger is not turned away because it's deserved. It's merited. It must take place. But the anger is meted out to bring you to a place of repentance. This, this discipline has a point. It isn't simply to punish, it's to preserve, it's to protect. It's because he loves you, even in the midst of your sin. He goes on to say, for the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore, the Lord will cut off head and tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush in one day. Well, who is the head? The head is the elder and honorable. He's the head, in case you were wondering. Who's the tail? The tail is the prophet who teaches lies. He's the tail. And those people still exist in the world today, and those people are leading God's people, in some cases, away from the Lord and into prosperity and seeking after worldly things and seeking after worldly solutions, as in the case of the southern kingdom of Judah, looking over Syria and their impending judgment 
in employment as judgment against the northern kingdom looking to Assyria to attack Syria from behind. I hope that's not confusing. Assyria to attack Syria from behind to draw Syria away from the southern kingdom of Judah before it's too late. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and that's the worst thing possible, when the leaders are those that are leading them into error, and those who are led by them are destroyed. If you allow yourself to be led by an unbiblical leader, you're asking for it. Therefore, the Lord will have no joy in their young men, nor have mercy on their fatherless and widows. Why not? Because everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly, or every mouth speaks foolishness as in the case of that chaplain on the floor of the house, a man and a woman. I mean, that's just utter foolishness, stupidity, a mockery of God. But for all this, his anger is not turned away. There's the righteous judgment, but all that can be wiped out. Why? Because his hand is stretched out still. For wickedness burns as the fire. This is what sin does. And anybody who's ever walked in sin in their life for any period of time, and I'm sure there's some, some nice gentlemen in here tonight that could testify to you about the harm that, cause, that sin causes. And this is why God hates sin, because he loves you so much that he hates the damage that's caused to your life by sin, by things like cigarettes and alcohol and drugs and, and thievery and connivery and covetousness and homosexuality and adultery and, and all of the wickednesses that we are prone to through the lust of the flesh. God doesn't say that sin is bad because it's, he's called it sin. No, it's, it's sin because it's bad. It's bad for you. And, and he doesn't want to see any kind of harm come to you and he will even discipline you to draw you back to himself and sometimes the discipline has to be worse than the the sin in, in terms of how it physically afflicts you or emotionally afflicts you or even spiritually afflicts you with a sense of, of separation from from almighty God wickedness burns as a fire it's destructive it destroys the enemy is called the destroyer he's the father of lies and everything that is not biblically true has the essence of a lie in it and it doesn't matter whether a lie is a you know just partially true or or completely untrue uh, the sometimes the, the things that sound true but are not are the most dangerous and it shall devour the the briars and the thorns the or reference to the sinners and the ungodly and kindled in the thickets of the forest they they shall mount up like rising smoke through the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up, and the people shall be as fuel for fire. No man shall spare his brother. And this is what happens to people when there's this kind of judgment going on. And he shall snatch on the right hand, cut off is what that word means in the Hebrew, and be hungry, he shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. Every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. And all that has to happen in any nation is a lack of resources. Let those resources be taken away, and in an instant, these fine, refined, gentle people become utter savages. It's dog-eat-dog. -dog. It's every man for himself when there's no toilet paper, when there's no gasoline. Imagine if there's no food and no police force. We turn into savages just like that, and, and it becomes all about me because unless I serve me, I'm going to die. Especially in a wicked land that's left Almighty God and turned away to idols. Let the idols try to save you. Manasseh, you're just talking, thinking about the infighting between the tribes of the northern kingdom. Manasseh shall devour Ephraim, and Ephraim... Manasseh, together they shall be against Judah. They're going to be fighting each other for the limited resources that, that remain available. But for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So 
God is so graceful, so unbelievably graceful. So the question is, can you not, Judah, from Isaiah's perspective, writing this on God's behalf, Judah, can you not see yourselves in this? United States of America, can you not see yourselves in this? I'm holding up a mirror to your culture. I'm holding up a mirror to your country. And you think that you're, you're, your greatness is, is the fact that you're the wealthiest nation that's ever lived in the history of the world. But I can take that away in a second, in an instant. It's, it, as I mentioned, it's just a thin veneer. It's, it's an imaginary thing that people depend upon. Can you not see yourselves in this? And Israel was, in fact, carried away by Assyria, the northern kingdom. Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune, which they have prescribed to rob the needy of justice and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. Now that, if you know the, the theme of Matthew chapter 23 where Jesus is talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And he, he lists out woes, woe after woe after woe after woe in front of the people. And these are the most religious guys. These are the guys that everyone looks up to and Jesus pronounces these woes on them for their hypocrisy, for their artificial, for their deception, for their destructive misleading of the people. And it sounds very familiar in this verse that, that Jesus has pronouncing against these the same kinds of things that, that we see here. What will you do? What will you do in the day of punishment? and in the desolation which will come from afar. What, what will you do when all the power's cut off? What will you do when there's no gasoline? What will you do when the grocery stores are empty? What will you do when there's no jobs? What will you do when all the banks are closed? What will you do when the market completely crashes? What will you do? We, hopefully, won't ever have to face that. We'll be out of here before that, that happens. And that's why we need to get busy about saving that last soul that's out there, I believe, today on the face of the earth. And when that soul is identified, boom, we're caught up. We escape. As was spoken so well this week, mass evacuation is what we're all about. But we can see these things coming, can't we? To whom will you flee for help? You know, the United States of America is the last great hope on earth in terms of national politics, in terms of geographical governments and those sorts of things, the governments of men. Um, hey, the United States of America has been a great nation, and I'm a patriot of the United States of America in the way that it was in its inception, its founding, its design, the, the majestic founding documents that, that set up this Judeo-Christian ethic that we live our lives according to, hopefully, that we are departing from at such a rapid pace, inviting the judgment of God upon this nation, and is what we're seeing some of that? I mean, all it took was for the government to control the people. And again, you know, this has been said better, by, better than me by, by many, that all it took for the government to completely take control was to instill fear in the people. And then boom, we, we gave up our liberties, we gave up our freedoms, and we hovered in our houses, and we hunkered down for as long as they told us to hunker down. Why? Because we were afraid, even as people that were not sick, of getting sick. And the design of that is frightening in the sense that it, it becomes a, a powerful precursor of what is yet to come. If that happens so easily, if we were manipulated so easily for the sake of safety, and you know it was Benjamin Franklin that said, if you give up liberty for the sake of safety, you deserve neither. And I firmly believe that. That unless we fight for our liberty, and chief among them the freedom to assemble and to worship our God, which the Bible commands, to whom will you flee for help if this nation falls? Anybody got plans going to New Zealand, Australia, 
They seem like maybe accommodating places. Of course, they're imposing this. You know, this is, again, the whole world responded to this thing at one time. You never see anything like it. Instead of the world being at odds with each other, boom, they all did the same thing. Without me, they shall bow down among the prisoners. Uh, where will you leave your glory? Without me, they shall bow down among the prisoners, and, and they shall fall among the slain. For all this, whew, for all this, his anger is not turned away, but, come on, please, his, his, hand, his hand of redemption, his hand of rescue is stretched out still. And we know that Israel, the northern kingdom, was carried away captive by Assyria in 722 B.C., just a little bit after this, a few short years after this. And we understand that Syria was an instrument in God's hand. God is using Syria as this stick to prod the nation of Israel back to himself. And we read about, you can read about, Israel, the northern kingdom, being carried away into exile in Assyria in 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 5 through 23. Syria, Assyria, is an instrument in God's hand. The, the nation Ahaz, king of the southern kingdom, Judah, the nation that you are allying yourself with is an instrument in God's hand. And that instrument that God is going to use for judgment is presently allied with Ahaz. We see that in 2 Kings chapter 16. And we remember that, that Ahaz even went and met with the king of Assyria and he saw an altar that he liked there, that he liked better than the altar in the temple at Jerusalem. And he called back to Uriah. You know, he sent letters to Uriah with instructions about how to build that pagan altar and put that in the temple instead, move the other altar aside, and let's full on bring in worldly stuff in the midst of the church. Let's, let's full on bring in the, the ways of the world when it comes to employing how it is that we worship God and just be done with all that, what we've been prescribed to do by the true and living God. When you ally yourself with evil, when you ally yourself with evil, do not expect evil to preserve you. So this alliance with Assyria, man, it's going to bite. It's going to bite. You ever try to drink your troubles away? Anybody? What happens at the end of that? You, you got worse troubles, don't you? You know? Drugs. You know, I... I, I Maybe shouldn't bring this up, but I, I definitely want to speak about this issue with, with great sensitivity. You know, when it comes to suicide, people are trying to escape the, the woes of their soul, but the soul is forever. All you can do, the fallacy, uh, the lie that, that Satan whispers in people's ears about escaping this world and, and the pains and the emotional struggles that exist in this world, all you can do is kill the body. The soul lives on forever. You will not accomplish what you desire by bringing an end to your own physical life. And I say that with a, with a heart for those people that are in that kind of, of despair that Satan is a destroyer. And, and the lies that he's whispering into your ears about, about just being done with it. And it, it's not like before you were born. Not according to God's word. All life is eternal. And to, let's say you bring about the end of your life and you're not saved, it's not going to get better on the other side. It's not going to get better. It's going to be eternally worse, eternally damnably worse. And that is not to say that as certain circles of the church present that, you know, Suicide is a mortal sin and there is no ch chance of salvation. You know, I, I think there are cases, 
my personal opinion, there are cases where believers are misled to the point of that and still because, why do I say that? Because Jesus says, what does Jesus say is the only sin that will not be forgiven man? Unbelief, you know, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And so I've done funerals for people that have committed suicide, believers, reported believers. I did not know the person, I just officiated. But I brought that hope to the family because this had been a young man who was a believer and he was caught up in some really bad circumstances and he put an end to his life because he was just overwhelmed by the lies of the enemy, I suppose, you know? And I hate that. I hate that the enemy has that kind of impact on people. But I would warn and I would caution that that doesn't make things better. It's, it's a mistake, it's a lie. It's the lie from the pit of hell to bring you into the pit of hell. If he could, for those that are not saved. And so, to look to a worldly solution to solve your problems, you know, it, it's, it's trying to defend yourself from spiritual attack by using physical means, willpower, whatever you have at your own, as your own resources. It won't work. You know, ultimately, 12-step programs don't work because you're not accomplishing anything through the power of God, you're trying to accomplish things through your own power. And I say that again affectionately, knowing that some people go through 12-step programs and find Jesus there. That happens, happens a lot. I don't preclude that possibility at all, but the, the basic principles of the 12-step program are not going to save you because they involve building up the flesh. And what we need to do is die to the flesh Put yourself to death, crucify the flesh, and receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is a spiritual means of defending yourself from the temptation of the enemy. Paul says there's no temptation such as not is common to man. God will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you may bear, but with the temptation, well, what? He will make a way of escape, won't he? The problem is we actually enjoy the thing that we're being tempted with. That's why the enemy employs that thing as a temptation because it is a temptation to us. But between the temptation, and temptation is not sin, between temptation and the commission of the sin, there's a little space there. It might be a millisecond or it might be an hour or it might be a day or it might be a week. But there's the time when you have the opportunity to call on the power of the the baptism with the Holy Spirit, to receive the power of God, to resist the temptation that the enemy would flee from you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you, James says. Don't try to, don't try to ally yourself with worldly methods when you've got a spiritual enemy, or even when you've got an earthly enemy. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger. God lays it out here. Assyria is a tool in God's hands, and, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. This is discipline. This is God's discipline. Yet he does not mean so, nor does he think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off not a few nations. And the problem is God's in control and they have no idea. For he says, are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Cano like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols. And there's the warning. And we know that when Sennacherib came down and they, they did rifle through the land and they did destroy and they came all the way up in their approach to Jerusalem. 
And, you know, we read about that in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 32. Just a, an amazing thing, uh, an amazing story of, of God's preservation. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32, there's this presentation made designed to strike fear in the nation of Judah. Do you not know what I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of other lands? Were the gods of the nations of those lands in any way able to deliver their lands out of my hand? Who is there among all the gods of those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed that could deliver his people from my hand that your God should be able to deliver you from my hand? And this taunt was delivered to Hezekiah who succeeded Ahaz and Hezekiah was a good king it's amazing that he was because his father was indeed so wicked and Hezekiah brought about a revival and revival was taking place in the land those altars those wicked altars were being torn down and destroyed and the places of idol worship were being destroyed and there was a revival taking place where the people were learning again the word of God. And so this threat now comes in the midst of a national repentance. And whether that national repentance is genuine or not, it's coming from the top. And the people are hearing the word of God again. And so revival was taking place in the southern kingdom of Judah, even as Assyria came, as afforded them, as according to the prophecies of God, and came right up to the neck, right up to the, the, the forefront of Jerusalem, and made these taunts at Jerusalem. Has any God ever been able to preserve any nation against our God? And that's all our God needed to hear. In 2 Kings chapter 18, we have it rendered to us, um, the great story. Of what happened to those who made those decrees and and that that whole relationship of of the taunts and the threats and and Hezekiah's response to the the taunts and the threats. And then in 2 Kings chapter 20, chapter 19, excuse me, we see what happened. And, And it was Isaiah that spoke to Hezekiah and informed the king, what the Lord was saying, was telling them because of their repentance about how he would take care of Assyria for them. And in 2 Kings chapter 19, 19, beginning at verse 32, we read, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with a shield, nor build a siege mound against it, By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come into the city, says the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake, remembering that Hezekiah is of the bloodline of David. And it came to pass in a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000 And when the people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass, this is the king of Assyria, now it came to pass as he was worshiping in the temple of Nisroch, his god, that his sons Adramelech and Sherezer struck him down with a sword and they escaped into the land of Ararat, then Esarhaddon. His son reigned in his place. So we have this pronouncement of God now, this instrument that he has used to threaten the southern kingdom, an instrument in his hand that destroyed the northern kingdom on their way, 722, carried them into exile. Now God judges Assyria for their pride. And we just read about that. And we read, you know, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, so shall 
shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? And, and the threat is real. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Lord has performed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem that he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. For he says, this is what Sennacherib said, the king of Assyria, by the strength of my hand I have done this, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent, and I have removed the boundaries of the people and robbed their treasuries. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand has found like a nest the riches of the people, and as one gathers eggs that are left, I've gathered all the earth, and there was no one who moved his wing, nor opened his mouth with even a peep. That sort of pride and arrogance, that's just a tool in God's hand. And God says, shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Because that was just what was being described. Look at what I've done. Look at what I'm doing. Shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it as if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up or as if a staff could lift it up as if it were not wood think you're special think you're gifted you want some fame for that gift that God has given you there should never be any glory for man because the the greatest man's greatest purpose is to be an instrument in God's hands and to be a willing instrument in God's hands Therefore the Lord of hosts, therefore the Lord of hosts will send, therefore the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among his fat ones, and under all his under his glory he will kindle a burning like the burning of fire. So the light of Israel will be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame, and it will burn and devour his thorns and briars in one day, and it will consume the glory of his forest and his fruitful field both soul and body, and they will be as when a stick man, as when a sick man, stick man, sick man, wastes away. Then the rest of the trees of his forest will be so few in number that a child may write them. How high can a child count? Not very high. So that's, that's the number of trees that, that will remain following God's judgment of Assyria. And it shall come to pass in that day, now looking forward, and he begins to address the remnant. There is a remnant in the northern kingdom of Israel, the most wicked of the, the two nations. There's a remnant there, and God speaks hopefully to that remnant that still exists in the middle of that nation. And this is where I'm all ears, because I think that we as a church of God, that we as a true church of God, are existing as a remnant in, in this day. And it shall come to pass in that day, looking forward to the reign of Christ, that the remnant of Israel and, and such as have escaped, again, we're looking far forward, Far to the future, and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defe defeated them. And now we're talking to the Jews prophetically about how they will give in to the Antichrist, believing that the Antichrist is Messiah. Why? Because he will promise them that they can rebuild their temple. And they're all set up for that. But God's going to defend and, and come to the aid of that remnant, what becomes the remnant, those that place their faith in Christ during the time of the tribulation, and they will never again, when their eyes are open, they will never again depend on him who defeated them, a direct reference to the Antichrist, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. And the remnant will return. The remnant of Israel. God is not through with Israel yet. The church has not replaced Israel. The remnant will return the remnant of Jacob. The remnant of Israel, the northern kingdom, there's a remnant there? Yes. To the mighty God, for though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. There's, there's many of you but it's only gonna be a remnant that returns. Only those who ultimately place their faith in Christ. 
The destruction decree shall overflow with righteousness, for the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of all the land. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, O my people, the remnant. God always has a remnant, doesn't he? Do not be afraid of the Assyrian, a a direct comparison, a reference to the Antichrist. He shall strike you with a rod and lift up a staff against you in the manner of Egypt. When the Antichrist turns against the Jews, when he commands to be worshipped as God in the temple, for yet a very little while and the indignation will cease as my anger in their destruction and the Lord of hosts will stir up a scourge for him like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb as his rod was on the sea, so will he lift it up in the manner of Egypt. It shall come to pass in that day, yet future, in that day, that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. Because you've received the Holy Spirit. He's come to Aleth. He has passed Migron, and, and this is the exact cities in the exact order. Remember, this is taking place 742. Assyria came after 722. So 20 years in advance, he's prophesying the exact order in which Assyria would come into the southern kingdom. He has come to Alath. He has passed Migron. At Michmash, he has attended to his equipment. Exactly what happened historically. They have gone along the ridge. They have taken up lodging at Geba. Ramah is afraid. Gibeah has, of Saul has fled as they're coming through um, the northern kingdom first on their way to the southern kingdom. O daughters of, lift up your voice, O daughters of Galim, cause it to be heard as far as Laish. O poor Anathoth, Madmanah has fled. The inhabitants of Gabim seek refuge. As yet he will remain at Nob in that day. He will shake his fist at the mount of the daughter of Jerusalem, the hill, the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. That's exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. And behold, in the days of Hezekiah, behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will lop off the bow with terror. Sennacherib, after his defeat, went back home. His own sons killed him while he was worshiping in his own temple. Those of high stature will be hewn down and the haughty will be humbled. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. And so I leave this to Pastor Rick for next Wednesday night because next week we're going to Idaho to visit my granddaughter. So I won't be here, but I'm serving up to Pastor Rick one of the greatest chapters in all of God's word. So Pastor Rick, take it away. And I can't wait to hear what a great job he does teaching Isaiah chapter 11. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the assurances that we see here. Um, sometimes they're confusing to our eyes and, and, and our ears, but never to our hearts. There's always a, an ingredient of your Holy Spirit that instructs us, even as we study these words for ourselves, let alone as we are taught and, and seek further understanding about what is meant. Uh, but the thing that we see here, Lord, is for all of our sins, for all of our foibles, no matter what they are, whether they're national or whether they're individual, your hand is stretched out still and your kindness and your goodness. And we also see, Lord, here that it's undeniable there is certain judgment for those who continue in their sin, for those who continue in their unbelief, for those who turn away from you, and Lord, this is, a, this is a plea for rescue for those that might find themselves in that condition. You see, God sent his only begotten son into this world to die to pay the price for your sins. That's his hand stretched out still to this day. It happened 2,000 years ago. His hand is stretched out still. None of your sin has dissuaded him. Even your unbelief has not dissuaded him. Even up to the moment of your death, with your last breath, He is that graceful, his hand is stretched out still to snatch you away from the fires of hell which were never created for you but for the devil and his angels. You can be born again, you can receive salvation and that quick. 
It's an instant. It, it's a turning. It's a repentance. It's a turning away from the sins that we read about here tonight. And we are always struggling against sin. We are always mired in sin in some cases. And apart from Jesus, there is no remedy for sin. And our sins are basically uncountable in their magnitude and in their multitude. But here tonight, Jesus will clean the whole slate. <laughs> the amazing thing is, not only does he take away your sin when you repent of it, when you place your faith in Christ and turn away from it, but here's the amazing part. He gives you his righteousness. So not only do we receive mercy, we also receive the greatest gift that's ever been given, the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ. And there's nothing that we can do to earn it because Jesus already has. It's already bought and paid for. All we have to do is place our faith and trust in that life that has been given. And so I want to give you an opportunity to do that. I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer. Prayer is simple because salvation is simple for those who will place their faith in it. The Bible says, hey, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Whew, eternal life in the kingdom of heaven, all your sin washed away, receiving the righteousness of Christ for that profession that Jesus is Lord, but there's meaning to that, isn't there? That means that I give my life to Christ. And this has great meaning. And it's the greatest meaning there is to give your life to Christ because you immerse yourself in a life bound up in, in unconditional love and his glory. And that unconditional love was expressed especially to you and for you. Let's pray. Father, I open my heart And I invite the Lord Jesus inside to be my Lord, to be my Savior, and to be my friend. Wash me clean, I pray, of all of my sins. For I've decided this day to follow you, Jesus, forever and ever. And I really mean it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.